So, Jonathan, hot question for you. Which is your favorite character in Friends? Uh, oh, it's got to be Ross, I guess. Hi. Oh, my God. What are you doing here? Well, you said you couldn't go out, so... You brought a picnic. Ugh, what a boyfriend. Why him? Because I identify with his ability to extract the worst out of a situation. <laughs> Ross, honey, this is very nice, but but I, I've got a crisis. Yeah, but I've got couscous. <laughs> So, uh, Friends is, to me, as a non-American, it feels uniquely American. Uh -huh. Because you have these, what, six odd people, and they're running around trying to you know, do well in their respective fields, all striving for their little slice of the American dream. <laughs> my first paycheck! Look at the window! There's my name! Hi, me! <laughs> and um, the thing that gets me every time is, of course, Central Perk. The cafe where everything happens. With, of course, the classic sofa. God, isn't this exciting? I earned this. I wiped tables for it, I steamed milk for it, and it was totally not worth it. I mean, to me, coffee is a very strong through line in something as quintessentially American as Friends. But coffee is, is a through line in so many American shows. No, well, listen, uh, Seinfeld. You wouldn't want me to mess up that beautiful face of yours. <laughs> That. He's always in the coffee shop with his bunch of guys. You think she thinks I have a beautiful face or is she just saying that? Well, they do work on tips. <laughs> and of course, Seinfeld went on to um, make the great series of uh, comedians in their cars getting coffee. Can we start with some coffee? Can I use some coffee? Well, this is where you cut to the dripping coffee. I would love some coffee. Cheers. Coffee? Sure. Which I'm very proud to say I've never ever seen. Well, which I can only say to you, James, is... Well, you're missing out on contemporary coffee history there. Oh, Jesus. Okay, we put it that way. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> All right, so James, there's a figure that I've always wanted to investigate. And that figure is 19.1 pounds per capita. That's the coffee consumption per capita per year of the United States in 1949. Wow. 19 pounds. Can we just visualize that in just raw coffee bean form? So, James, you see the cat sat next to me and you know I have two of them. Imagine that I took both my cats and turned them into coffee beans, which is, <laughs> which is a really frightening concept. So two cats worth of coffee. Per person. Per, per person. Year. Per year. Every American. Yeah. So how did America become so coffee obsessed? Well, James, I mean, the standard story is fairly simple, isn't it? You know, the, it's the Boston Tea Party, overthrow the British, no more tea. Everyone's going to mm. start drinking coffee, civil war, everyone's mm -hmm. getting coffee. Coffee becomes an American right. Mm. The gold miners drink it, the cowboys drink it. The masses come to America to drink coffee. You know, so it's always a highly caffeinated place, according to legend. Well, I mean, so we can end, end, finish the episode here, right? I mean, there's our answer. Legend is not reality. <laughs> oh, really? The thing is, James, actually, there's a lens of reading American history through beverages that is a lot more interesting and complicated than just a coffee drinking nation. So this is going to be a story of America and its key historical moments through the lens of coffee. I think this is going to be a story of America through the lens of competing beverages. Ooh. And I'd like to say that this free educational content was brought to you today by Rancilio, the manufacturers of Italian espresso machines. And we'll hear a little bit more about them towards the end. I'm James Harper, documentary maker and the creator of Filter Stories, a coffee podcast. And I'm Jonathan Morris, professional historian and author of Coffee, A Global History. And this is the final episode in the second series of A History of Coffee, where we explore how a tiny psychoactive seed changed the world and continues to shape our lives today.
So Jonathan, the first question in the story of coffee in America is, well, obviously, when did coffee first arrive in America? And I actually Googled this. So are you ready to hear what the internet has to tell me? Yeah, you've made me redundant. Go for it. (laughs) Brilliant. In 1607, Captain John Smith, a British adventurer, brought his love and enthusiasm of coffee to the newly discovered Americas. Smith was a bit of a rabble rouser. And legend has it that while Smith and his men were out foraging for food and hunting deer, he was captured by the Powhatan tribe, who had just about had enough of his antics. And just before getting his head thumped in by a club-wielding executioner, the Powhatan's chief's beautiful 14-year-old daughter intervened. She is now known by her nickname Pocahontas, but her real name was Mataoka. To spare Smith, Pocahontas threw herself between the cocky captain and the wavering club. The chief relented to his daughter's compassion, and Smith was spared. Afterwards, the captain offered the chief some coffee as a quote-unquote peace offering. That is quite a story. Yeah, that is quite a story. Mm. This is a story you'll find all over the internet in many different places. And there's just one thing about it that really doesn't work for me. What is that? The date. 1607. 1607 is the foundation of Jamestown. So 1607 is 30 years before the first recorded instance of anyone drinking or having coffee in Britain. Mm. which kind of is getting a little bit problematic. 30 years is a long time. Well, it's a long time, and also it's not like the day after this happens that coffee is widespread and you can go and get it and other people are habituated to it. Mm. So I believe Smith might have had a little bit of coffee for personal use, as they say. Right. But there's no way that this sort of started active coffee consumption amongst settlers in America because there were no merchant ships delivering coffee into Jamestown. And I don't believe that he would have put sacks of coffee on the ship. Doesn't make any sense. But there is another way of making sense of this story. And that is to think maybe rather than Smith introducing coffee to the indigenous peoples, Mm. maybe they introduced Smith and the settlers to something similar to Mm -hmm. coffee. All right. Something that was caffeinated, that was dark, that was even known as the black drink. Wow. And which came from the one plant in North America known to have caffeine within it. That's what I call turning the tables. <laughs> that is turning the tables. But suddenly things make a lot more sense if you do that round. We know that there is a plant in the southern, particularly southeastern United States, that naturally produces caffeine. It's only one. Really? And it goes by the name of Yaupon Holly. Look it up. Yaupon Holly and look it up now. Yeah. Oh, wow. That looks very coffee-like. Doesn't it? Isn't it amazing? You know, if I sort of slipped that in your eyes and you hadn't looked at it hard, you'd say that was a coffee plant. I mean, it it wouldn't be a million miles away from a variety or species of coffee, sure. No. Tell the listeners what you're looking at, James. Well, it's like a green bush. It has these somewhat spiky green leaves. Yeah. And surrounded with these bundles of red looking cherries. I guess they're not cherries. I guess they're berries. Yeah. We'll put a link in the show notes. That is it. My mind was blown away by this. I should say, by the way, that I got an invitation to appear in a historical podcast. Mm-hmm. A podcast called All Things Tudor, produced by a lovely lady called Deb Hunter. And I wrote back to Deb and said, well, but there isn't really any coffee in Tudor times. Now, it turns out that Deb is also an expert in the first tribes of the United States and their history. Oh. So the original indigenous Americans. Interesting. And she said, you need to know about what the indigenous tribes prepared. Hmm. The indigenous tribes made a drink hmm. using Yaupon holly. Wow. And that drink is known as the black drink. Are you saying, so, you know, Smith comes along, he's drinking this black drink. People today assume it's coffee, but it's actually what the, you know, indigenous Native Americans were drinking all along, which is Yapon Holly. That is exactly what I'm saying. Because we know that there were people using 
the black drink from the colonists as early as sort of 1615-ish. Oh, wow. So we know there was this interchange. So I would posit that actually this is a story that goes the other way around. Hmm. Indigenous Americans showed the colonists the black drink. The colonists may have been aware of the notion of coffee as a black drink and believe they are having coffee. Yeah. I'm just dying to try some of this myself. Do we have any idea what it's like to drink? It is said to be by a f- professor of food chemistry at Texas A&M that actually Yaopan is like coffee and tea. It's rich in antioxidants, the polyphenols. Mm. He says that the caffeine levels in Yaopan vary, but they're roughly equivalent to green or black tea. And indeed, we know that there's a whole ceremony or the whole sort of set of rituals around the consumption Hmm. of the black drink. The black drink is kind of brewed in a fairly big pot and then it's Hmm. ladled out quite often into shells. So kind of like conch shells, because we're down near the southern coast of the US or in Florida, Carolinas, Mm -hmm. etc. There's a very much a sort of a ritual to this. In many ways, when you think about, you know, what's the beverage that powers America, right? And many would say coffee. Yeah. But, I mean, what's indigenous actually to the land of North America? Well, Yapon Holly, I mean, if we were to rewrite history, wouldn't that be a more appropriate drink for America to fall in love with? Wouldn't it just? And it seems like there was quite a lot of consumption until quite late. I mean, it's, it's supposed to have been common up until the 1890s, mostly used in the Carolinas, particularly North Carolina. Hmm. Uh, and it kind of becomes stigmatized because it becomes associated with the rural poor. Oh, really? So, right? Yeah. So this is a poor man's beverage, poor man's coffee, etc. Okay, so Jonathan, Yalpan Holly aside, back to my original question. When did people in North America drink actual coffee? We know that the colonists were drinking coffee by the 1700s. Mm-hmm. We know, in fact, that there were coffee houses mm-hmm. founded in the settlements. Huh. Some very famous coffee houses. All right. In which actually some of the planning for what became the American Revolution took place. But there is another great event, James, that I'm sure you're aware of, that is supposed to be the moment when Americans adopted coffee as their patriotic duty to drink. Do you know that moment? (laughs) Um, I believe so. It happens in Boston, right? And involves a lot of tea. It does. But I really don't know that much about it. So can you paint for me a bigger picture of what's going on at this time? I know in the early 1700s, the British are in control of Boston and beyond. Yes, they're basically occupying most of the northeastern seaboard of the US. Who else is in North America at this point? We have a bit of French Mm -hmm. down in Louisiana. Right. We have some Spanish, notably over on the far coasts in the Pacific and also in Florida. Uh But what we have mostly is these 13 colonies, the famous 13 colonies belonging to the Brits. Uh Now, a dispute is growing up and it is basically about the trade rules and economic rules under which the colonies are run. Mm. So if the colonists are forced to buy tea from Britain Mm -hmm. and pay tax on that tea, Hmm. then they feel affronted by the duties that they're basically seeing levied upon them. So let me be clear. You have, at least in the 13 states all the way on the East Coast, you have the British having these colonies, and I'm assuming there's agriculture, there's a bit of trade going on, but they're basically still under the king, the British crown, and they're growing prosperous enough where they're like, hold on, like Britain's all the way over there and they're taxing us. And, you know, why should we give our hard-earned money to them? For what exactly? We can run our own business. Thank you very much. You're getting it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you want tea, you're going to have to get it through, as it were, the British colonial supply line. And if you do that, 
by the way, you're also going to pay this import duty on your tea. Uh huh. And no, you don't get any choice about that. And you certainly don't get any chance to put yourself into the British Parliament to suggest that this isn't a good idea. Of course not. Oh, and that's the point, because the people in these British colonies in North America, they're getting taxed, but they have no political say. Very good. We'll make a rebel of you yet. (laughs) Yeah, exactly so. (laughs) And so I'm assuming the Boston Tea Party is where it all goes down. What happens? The Boston Tea Party is a famous moment when a bunch of rebels go onto British ships in Boston Harbour and throw out the tea chests that they were bringing in. Got it. And the colonists object to taxation without representation. Mm -hmm. And it's supposedly said that this is the moment when Americans say, okay, we're not going to have tea, we're not going to deal with the Brits, we're going to have our own drink, it's going to be coffee. It's it's a good story. If you're an American, it's your patriotic duty to drink coffee. So, Boston's Harbour, I can imagine, is full of these chests of tea bobbing up and down, brewing the salty water, creating some kind of horrendous uh, (laughs) mixture for the fishes to drink. America has thrown off the British. We are now independent. We're going to run our own country. Thank you very much. And we're going to hammer the point home by not drinking tea anymore. So I'm assuming from this point onwards, tea wasn't being drank at all. And everyone just switched the coffee. Well, that's um, a nice assumption, James. And of course, it's our role to destroy nice assumptions. (laughs) It's true that America started importing more coffee. But of course, once America became independent, Mm -hmm. actually what they really did within a few years was just start importing tea from China. Oh, yeah? So what we actually know in truth is that Americans in this period went back to drinking primarily tea, but they were also drinking some coffee. But I mean, the American War of Independence from Britain was like 1770, 1780s. I mean, did they start drinking coffee in a big way from the 1800s onwards? For sure, during the 1800s, consumption of coffee increases quite significantly. By 1830, they're consuming about three pounds per capita. In 1850, five pounds per capita. So coffee per capita is rising. And to prove the point here, 1881, uh, America is importing about 80 million pounds of tea. Right. And 450 million pounds of coffee. Interesting. So, which is the more popular drink? Well, granted, of course, coffee is heavier than tea per brew. So, hard to say in terms of actual cups. But nevertheless, um, tea is very popular as well. That was one of the best pieces of hedging (laughs) by a man who does coffee science and brewing for a living. So, we're talking about five times as much. Mm. And roughly speaking, that five times as much by weight would give you equal in terms of brewing. Huh. Okay. Roughly speaking. So, roughly speaking, pretty much in 1880, mm. you're talking about America having still been at a half tea, half coffee point. Hmm. And that's sort of shown to us by some of the great companies that are founded at this stage. Hmm. So, there's a very famous company called A&P which becomes a chain store and a grocery. Hmm. I remember using it when uh, I used to visit my in-laws in America. Uh But the original name for A&P, the Great American and Pacific Tea Company. So so where's coffee in the name, though? Coffee's not in the name. Huh. Didn't have as much coffee. Tea was what they sold. I mean, they had a coffee and they had a coffee brand, but it just was not as popular. You know, they thought tea was the thing to sell on. Hmm. In other words, what I'm trying to say to you is we make a mistake in assuming that Americans were patriotically only drinking coffee (laughs) after the Boston Tea Party. No, Americans were drinking things. What they weren't drinking for at least some period was anything that had come from Britain. Okay, so we've had the American War of Independence in the later 1700s. We're now in the early 1800s. Tea is very popular, and coffee is getting slowly more popular as well. And I want to make a linkage back 
to our episode on Haiti, where we have the formerly enslaved Haitians and their descendants after a horrendously bloody conflict. They now run the country, but they discovered that nobody wanted to buy their coffee except the French on extremely punitive terms. And this includes, of course, I'm guessing, America, Mm -hmm. right? Americans weren't buying Haitian coffee. Why not? Well, there are a few reasons, but the first and most obvious reason is America, like everywhere else, was very suspicious of Haiti. Mm -hmm. After all, America is a society where, particularly in the South, slave plantations are the norm. Right. So the idea of trading with a nation in which there has been a revolution to overthrow a slave-based society is not something that's going to be particularly welcomed. And there are... Mm clear alternatives. So Hmm. by the time that hating coffee production is back on its feet, America actually is taking most of its coffee from Cuba Hmm. up until the 1840s. And Cuba is where many of those coffee producers who were able to escape from Haiti re-established themselves in Cuba using enslaved labor. Hmm. A period that's almost known as the second slavery. Wow. So let me just be clear about this. America, a slave-owning society, which uses enslaved black Africans to work agriculture in horrendous conditions, also drank coffee and didn't want to purchase coffee from, you know, a society of formerly enslaved who were now free and chose to buy their coffee from a neighboring island, which was run by Europeans and used enslaved labor. Yeah, that's about the size of it. So you've got a more complex situation because what we need to take into account, what becomes the biggest event in US history, of course, in the 19th century is the American Civil War. So just to to remind you, after the War of Independence from Britain in the 1780s, there are basically 13 original founder states. And then other states start to be admitted into the Union, the United States. As we go through the 1800s, Some of those states have outlawed slavery. Some, particularly those that more recently come into the Union, haven't. So as the Union grows, there's a real question. Mm. Are we going to have enslaved societies? Are we going to have societies that are based on slavery? Or are we going to have societies that are not? (laughs) But this becomes more and more tense. So what ends up happening in 1860 is the election of a president... Abraham Lincoln, who is committed to the abolition of slavery Mm -hmm. at a federal level, because this is also a big dispute about what is for states to decide and what is for the federal United States government to decide, right? So Lincoln wants to abolish slaveholding and plantation agriculture using enslaved labor across the United States. He wants to abolish slavery across the United States. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That leads the southern states to secede from the United States, to declare independence of the United States, and the war breaks out between the Union, i.e. the Union of the United States, and this so-called confederacy of secessionist states in the South. And at the heart of this is the issue of slavery, Mm. but that issue of slavery is understood in terms not just of the moral aspects of slavery, but also, as it were, two different sets of economic societies, two different underlying versions of economies, because really those northern states are moving to more industrialized societies, whereas the southern remain more agricultural. Mm -hmm. So I recall in the last series, the role coffee played in that civil war. Yeah. So remind me, which side had the coffee? The union had the coffee, And they had the coffee because they blockaded the southern ports so the southerners couldn't get coffee. Ah. Okay. Even though they were closer to the coffee growing islands of the Caribbean. Hey, he who controls the seas, my friend, basically. Mm. So the consequence is that Union soldiers, the anti slavery North, are fighting but being given as part of their rations every day a large amount of coffee. So you put coffee on first thing in the morning and you put it on last thing at night and you eat it with your hardtack with this kind of, you know, biscuity hardtack bread. And this becomes a standard sort of meal, really, coffee and tack. Hmm. 
But of course, the coffee also keeps troops alert. Mm -hmm. It keeps them warm, keeps them awake. It has those psychoactive things. Generals become quite aware of those effects, actually. So they want to keep their troops with coffee. Mm -hmm. There are famous things about the coffee ration. Hmm. You've got to make sure that everyone gets an equal amount of coffee. Right. So they put the coffee right. on like a bed sheet. Mm -hmm. And a sergeant is charged with dividing it into, you know, roughly equal piles. But of course, right. just to make sure that then everyone gets a fair crack, right? one officer stands facing away from the coffee pile so he can't see it. Okay. Another walks along, pointing at a pile and says, who shall have this coffee? Oh, wow. And the guy who can't see shouts out the name of who will get that <laughs> coffee from the roll. <laughs> Okay, so this is the importance of making wow. sure your coffee is divided fairly. Now, that's a coffee ritual. Now, that is a coffee ritual, absolutely <laughs> a coffee ritual, and absolutely critical because this is all about morale. Mm. Yeah? Think how important coffee must be to morale if you have to do this for it. How are they making the coffee? Well, actually, you make coffee on a battlefield the same way you make coffee out in the open as a cowboy, etc. You literally crush the grounds throw it in a pot, boil up the grounds and the water together for 20, 25 minutes, actually. Oh, my God. And uh, pour your coffee. Yeah, That's a high extraction. Um, <laughs> That's a very extractive that, coffee. Uh, yeah, my goodness. absolutely. Uh, I mean, this is the same technique, you know, would be being used in the home quite often. Mm. What's interesting is what do you add to the coffee hmm. to get the grounds to go down at the end? Because you want to keep it relatively clean. And they would add things like egg whites. Okay. If you're crude, you can add fish skin. Mm. If you're more refined, you take the refined fish skin product, which is a gelatine called isinglass. Huh. And this is basically introduced to settle the coffee grounds at the end of the brew. I, wow. Uh, that's a science there that needs to be explored. I need to explore this. Um, yeah, I've, I feel there's some <laughs> practical experiments coming on. Quite disgusting experiments, but experiments nonetheless. So this is what I find somewhat ironic. It's the 1860s. Where is most of the coffee that the Union, the North, where are they getting their coffee from at this point? Brazil. And Brazil at this point is importing a huge number of enslaved people. Yes, it's certainly still an economy with enslaved people working in it, including on coffee plantations. It gets you wondering, right? Because here's Haiti, a country which is formerly enslaved, now free, growing coffee, Heaven forbid they need the business of America. But the North, which is where slavery is something they're fighting against in their own country, is happily buying coffee from places where it is grown using enslaved labor. I think that is not uncommon after all. By that point, 1860, most European countries have abolished slavery or in their colonies. Okay. Most would be nonetheless importing coffee from countries such as Brazil, where certainly slavery still existed. Brazil is one of the very last countries to abolish slavery. Mm. And the reasons for that were partly because coffee producers, amongst others in Brazil, were advocating that they couldn't work without enslaved labor. <laughs> so yeah, I see the moral dilemma mm. that you are putting in. I fear that not many people were making their consumption decisions in those ways. So here we have the North, the Union. They are wired on coffee, but they blockaded the South, mm -hmm. the Southern ports, so they can't get coffee. So what are they doing? Are they just walking around with blistering, <laughs> you know, uh, headaches deprived of energy? Well, they adopt some of the usual surrogates for coffee. Go looking for acorns, mm -hmm. go looking for grains that they can roast. But you know what, James? There's something very interesting here. Mm -hmm. These are the guys who need caffeine, and they find their caffeine from the black drink, the Yopan Holly drink that we talked about. Wow. So we know they, because we're in the right area, the Yopan Holly, they are foraging Yopan Holly to make their black drink, the black drink that has been learned from the Native Americans. Wow. God, too, that's too much irony for me. <laughs> I can't take it. I can't take it.
So Jonathan, we're now towards the end of the 1800s. You know, there's the myth that America is fueled by coffee. Not really borne out in reality. Like, tea is still extremely popular around this time. But then again, we know that today, tea has really fallen by the wayside compared to coffee. So what are the things that get Americans to start drinking a lot more coffee from the end of the 19th century? The first thing, I think, is that from the end of the 19th century is really the big boom in migration from Europe and elsewhere into America. It's when the population of America really grows. And most of those people are people who are desirous of drinking coffee and have coffee as their cultural reference point rather than tea. Let me give you an example. The Italians, the Italians who go to New York, become big coffee drinkers. They can afford coffee. Coffee becomes something by which they measure their status. The social workers in New York, by the way, are terrified by this because they see the Italians giving coffee to their kids. And so they actually try and urge them to drink milk because milk is good for you and they should be drinking milk in the morning. But of course, the Italians want their kids to drink the same as them. They're not going to go through extra uh, activity to get the milk, which they don't like. And so their kids are going to damn well drink coffee alongside them for breakfast. Now, repeated across the various different sort of migration groups into the States, that I think is a big driver for why coffee grows in terms of relative proportion of consumption. Mm. But there are three other key reasons, I think, that apply across the whole of US society. Okay. Okay. Coffee gets cheaper. Coffee becomes a kind of a well-marketed consumer good in what is becoming the first mass consumer society. And uh, towards the end of this period, coffee actually becomes, in effect, promoted by some government practices. Huh. So, should we start with price? Let's do it. So, if we look from 1821 to 1902, uh, the price of coffee in 1902 is one-third, so that's one-third of the level that it was in 1821. Wow. And that is almost entirely attributable to the massive growth in output in Brazil, which becomes overwhelmingly the largest coffee producer in the world, pumping out cheap coffee. And dear listener, if you want more details as to how Brazil was able to produce cheaper and cheaper coffee, we cover that in depth in the third episode of our first series, Coffee Catches Fire. Anyway, so cheaper coffee means more Americans can now drink coffee. Let's touch on your second point, coffee as a consumer good. So tell me about the time where coffee was not sitting in a beautifully packaged bag on a supermarket shelf. What you begin to see is the rise of businesses purely roasting and selling coffee. Huh. So the first big one, as we say, is Arbuckles. Mm. Its first innovation is basically about selling coffee in pre-wrapped paper. That's an innovation? That's an innovation, it's an innovation when you consider that up until the end of the 1800s, coffee is basically being brought like the way you would buy dried beans in a, in a market hall today, yeah? You scoop it out of the, of the barrel, you weigh it, you plonk it into your bag. Huh. The key here is you see the rise of packaging, mm. the rise of other preservation techniques, tins, vacuuming. Wow. So the coffee tin towards the end of the 19th century, an absolutely critical thing. <laughs> and then through things as we move into the early 20th century, through particularly the quite innovative use of advertising and sponsorship right through to the rise of radio, and then you'd mm -hmm. be hearing coffee ads on the radio and mm -hmm. coffee-sponsored radio broadcasts. No matter what your favourite entertainment is, you'll always find it on the Maxwell House Showboat. The Maxwell House Showboat is a, a very, very popular show. Cooling drink of ice Maxwell House coffee with its friendly stimulation that buoys you up and never lets you down. So coffee is at the forefront of those things. And it's right across the technical, the industrial, the distribution and the marketing. Interesting. And what about that third reason? You know, the government actively promoting coffee consumption. In the Second World War, you got to build a lot of arms, you got to build a lot of armaments, you got to build a lot of munitions. Mm -hmm. And the government did many studies about its munitions workers to work out what would make them more and more efficient. And it came to the conclusion that the answer was coffee breaks, huh. allowing them to go off and have a coffee and then get back on the job. Wow. Was 
actually fairly critical to keeping them focused and keeping them high performing. Are you meaning to tell me that these poor sods making all these munitions were working hour after hour with no coffee break? <laughs> Oh my god. Well, I mean to tell you that once they got a coffee break, they were a lot more productive. Oh, goodness me. Okay. So this became part of the whole principle of almost scientific management. Mm. So by really the mid 1950s, they reckon about 60% of factories in America had coffee breaks. Wow. If you're an American, there is no escaping coffee. So Jonathan, we're taking a small little detour from our story, and uh, you are here next to me, remarkably, in Berlin, at Ranchilio's new flagship store, the BER station. That's right, James, and um, that enables us to say again to thank Ranchilio for enabling us to make this free educational content for the entire coffee community. And if you don't know, Ranchilio have been producing espresso machines for almost a hundred years. That's about as old as you, right? Uh, nowhere near. <laughs> um, however, just to say, you know, remember in the episode on Italy, we talked about how Italian espresso machine manufacturers these days are primarily export orientated to huge markets such as the US. Yes. And what I found interesting was this morning, talking with the team, Ranchilio were explaining to us how they've developed a machine that responds to feedback from their American specialty customers. And the outcome of that is a machine called the Invicta. So a few innovations include pre-infusion, which enables baristas to brew consistent coffees despite having quite different roast dates, and also new boiler technology which has very low energy consumption and thermal stability, so you can just like crank out the shots over and over again. Yeah, so if you're interested in that machine, there'll be a link in the show notes. Now time to go back to America and finish off our story about its love affair with coffee. <laughs> so Jonathan, You've taken me on this wonderful journey looking at America's infatuation with coffee. And, you know, when I went into this episode, I had the impression that America's love affair with coffee is kind of like Phoebe and Mike Hannigan's in Friends. Huh? <laughs> Go on, James. <laughs> so basically what happens is that, you know, it's love at first sight. They have a, you know, short, kind of messy beginning, like, like they always do. I'm sorry, really, I'm so embarrassed. I'm a pretty nice guy. Just ask my parole officer. <laughs> but they get married, like, before you know it. Okay, and? So America sees coffee, falls in love with it, and kaboom. American and coffee are together forevermore. Right, and we've busted that one, haven't we? Well, that's the thing. Like, in reality, it's not like uh, Phoebe and Mike Hannigan's at all. It's probably more like Monica and Chandler's. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Allow me to explain. Please do. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously they were friends for like the longest time. Yeah. And Monica had, you know, her fair share of love interests. Richard Burke, you know, started very strong, but fell apart when the guy didn't want to commit to kids. Okay. Then there was Fun Bobby. You remember him, Fun Bobby? I'm, 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 I'm way out of my depth right, here, James. There Carry was fun, on. <laughs> there was fun, Bobby. And it became actually a lot less fun once he stopped drinking. Uh -huh. um, and then the millionaire, Pete Becker. The problem there, of course, was that she didn't share, you know, his passion for crazy extreme sports. But this entire time, you know, Monica and Chandler, friends for the longest time, they started seeing each other romantically in secret. Took a long time, but it grew slowly, slowly. And then finally, in the final season of the show, they get married in this beautiful ceremony. J James, I'm flabbergasted. <laughs> so I take your moniker and Chandler, and I'm going to up it and confuse it, but come back to show you that you're all right. Okay? Like a good historian. Like a good historian. All right. I'm going to embellish for you. Because I like the analogy. It's a real ongoing, deep friendship where it comes up and then goes away and comes mm. back. Because, for example, we've talked in this episode, we hit that post-war period with the introduction of the coffee breaks and the motorized society in mm. America and so forth. And we reached peak coffee consumption per capita in 1949. Mm. 19.1 pounds, James. But by 1995, actually, which is around the time, I think, that Friends starts, 
Yeah. That has fallen to a mere six pounds wow. per capita. So actually, America was falling out of love with coffee. Or to be more accurate, I'll tell you what it was doing. It was falling in love with a new pretender, and that was a new source of caffeine, cola. Oh, no. Right? Oh, no. Really soft drinks driven by our friends. You know, they'd made the world a place you'd like to sing or whatever it was. They were the guys who've been hoovering up. But from the start of Friends ish in 1995 if we go back now to today mm. and hey the start of specialty and more accurately the start of some of those international coffee chain formats mm -hmm. uh, of which one we know i'm glad you said it for me mm -hmm. uh, and where do we end up well, we're back up now to i think about 9.7 pounds per capita so actually america once again is discovering that its friend <laughs> coffee is something that it values So, thanks for listening to this episode four of the History of Coffee series two. Pray tell, Jonathan, what should our dear listener expect for episode five? Numero cinque. Numero cinque non esiste. <laughs> no, because we're at the end of the series, James. Oh, no. I'm afraid the answer is nothing. <laughs> so but sad. I would say, you know, it's been great fun. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I think we're still just about enough friends that we'd be <laughs> interested to hear if people would like to have any more of this type of content. And if you do, go to our social media and drop us a line. Absolutely. If you want to hear Series 3 of A History of Coffee, we're happy to make it, but you tell us whether you want to hear it. Also on social media, we will put up some illustrations pertaining to American coffee history over the ages. So the coffee brands, the Boston Tea Party drinking stats maybe james what are you going to put up i will put up some images of japan honey if you would still like to learn more about the history of coffee then of course i recommend coffee a global history by me jonathan morris great read i highly recommend it and if you want to help others find the show one thing you can do is write a review on apple podcasts you can also go on spotify and give the show a five-star rating that would really help the algorithms uh you can also this is kind of cool Take a screen grab of you listening to it on your podcast player and then post that screen grab on Instagram. Tag me at Filter Stories Podcast and you, Jonathan. At Coffee History JM. And we'll repost it. Thank you a million times for shouting about the show. And thank you very much in advance. Yeah. And James, important to say once again, thanks to Ranchilio for enabling us to create this free educational content about the history of coffee. Absolutely. If you are in the market for a home espresso machine, or indeed for a coffee machine on your bar, I've put a link in the show notes. A History of Coffee was produced by myself, James Harper, and you, Jonathan Morris. I edited it all together, and uh, I write and play the piano music. Well, I hope we'll be speaking again, James. Hope so. And I hope we'll be talking to listeners and that those listeners will maybe have a cup of joe in <laughs> their hands joe. a cup of joe cup of in joe. their hands <laughs> <laughs>